Shea Cotton, aka Manchild. Um, I have a documentary that's dropping on the 23rd of this month. Uh, it's a story of my life, a guy growing up in LA, a childhood prodigy uh, that was a can't misfire in the NBA, that was undrafted, and the story is an enigma. A resilience, um, inspiration, I think uh, accountability, um, and hope. I was the number one player in the country in North America in 1995 over guys like Kobe and a lot of other players. And I was a surefire guy for the NBA and that it didn't work, you know, it didn't happen. Things happened out of my control. You know, my career went in a different direction. So at the end of the day, if it could happen to me, it could happen to anyone's kid. And whether you're a sports person or not, this story is real, it's authentic, and you know, it, it's powerful. I think uh, kids as well as adults can take something from this to be a better person. Playing in the NBA Players Camp uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. I think I was a sophomore, rising junior. It was going into his senior year. We're actually the same age. I'm about three or four months older than him. Rest in peace to him, obviously. Passed away as of late. But, you know, for me, it, when, when me and Kobe had our one-on-one -on -one battle, you know, he I was a problem. So he couldn't really physically, I was just way too much for him. And I think my skill set was so advanced from everybody else. You know, the, the matchup was like one of my best that I've ever had, but I was better than him. And, you know, the game that we played, our team won that game too. So, you know, we uh, we developed a bond from that point, I think, because I don't know if he ever played against a guy who went at him like I did. And I felt the same way about his in encounter with me. I said, wow, this guy just kept coming at me. Even after he knew that I got the better end, he just kept coming. So. And I love that because of that that's how I was as a player. I didn't back down from anybody. I, mean, I played up all the time. I, I was growing up playing against guys three or four years old. I mean, I've got 10 NBA players in the film talking about what I've meant to the trap of the basketball and that I drove them to become the all-stars of the NBA that they became. So, I mean, what is that saying? You know, like people need to read through the lines when they watch this documentary and recognize that if it happened to me, it could happen to anybody's kid. So take it serious because I don't want this to happen to anyone else. At 12, I had national attention. So you know, I went into high school with a name nationally already. I was already ranked top 25 in the country when I entered modern day high school. So, it, you know, the, the the early fame is much harder to, to uphold and, 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 and stay on top because you're young and there's so much going on and I wasn't raised to be a professional ball player. You know, my parents were doing the best they could with me and my brother growing up in Los Angeles. You know, and it was a rough time at that, at that time. It was a much different day than today. So we had less opportunity and I think I really, I played with a chip on my shoulder and really wanted to show the world that I could play. Then when I became 15 and was on Sports Illustrated with a four page layout, you know, that things just got crazy from that point. I was living in a fishbowl and I really couldn't go places in public like I used to because I was so known at that point, so young. And it's like, well, where do you go from here? So my parents did a great job keeping me and my brother humble, hardworking, and uh, I still took the trash out. So that mm -hmm. definitely helped. <laughs> it's long overdue. Um, it's, it's it's interesting, you know, I consider the, the institution as far as university is concerned, it's a business. You know, everybody's making money with the student athlete and they're the ones putting it out, laying it on the line every day. You know, whether practice, you know, in the games, uh, public appearances, you know, the school gets all that that recognition and, and that financial, financial gain. Now, I wouldn't say it's a balance, but I think they're starting to recognize that student athletes need to be compensated on some level whether it's for your likeness or your sponsorship or whatever the case may be, I'm glad to see these rules are starting to change and I would like to think that I had something to do with that. So, you know, with Section Bill 206, you know, that it, it applies to me, the name, image, and likeness. So that's something that I'll be incorporating into this whole movement with the documentary release and everything that I'm doing moving forward as well. It's great, great, great story. You know, two guys out of Chicago, um, they're parallel stories and it just shows the contrast, um, how, their, how their careers went, you know, what they dealt with in their lives. I mean, it's great, great piece. You know, I, I said when we first started this, this documentary with my production team, our true group out of Long Beach area, 
I said, listen, if we can be in the conversation with a hoop dreams or, you know, uh, blue chips or some of these other basketball films that that were films that were big for us when we were coming up, we won. So I feel like we're on our way. Um, hoop dreams done well. I don't know if people even realize they made over 17 plus mil, you know, to date. So. I mean, who would ever thought? It's raw footage, it's pixelated, you know, compared to the high definition, clean cut stuff today. And I mean, they did fantastic considering probably what they put in. I'm sure it was very little. You know, my, my documentary is much different. We've got pixelated mixed in with high definition recent stuff. Uh, we have really clean, clean visual and audio footage. And I'm excited, you know, with the, the production team, they did a great job. They brought, they brought my idea to life. And um, everybody that watches it is really excited. They're pleased with the product and people can't stop talking about it. Probably when I was playing in Europe, um, I was overseas uh, about five years into my pro career. And, you know, it just seemed like I was living out of a suitcase and I was from one country to the next. And I said, you know, this isn't what I had in store for my pro career. And I don't know where, where things kind of got derailed, but, uh, at that point, I knew I was just playing to make money and, and just to exhaust my repertoire while I could. And, you know, when I was tired, I was going to hang my sneakers up. So that was my intention. I played 10 years professionally and I had a daughter that was conceived. So I chose the fatherhood rather than continue playing and make a difference in my community. And that's what I'm doing today. Uh, doing a lot of mentoring. I do a lot of um, public speaking engagements at schools, different AAU programs. And, foundations and stuff like that across the country as well as a lot of one-on-one -on -one training and, you know dealing with the mind and your body as well as uh, the nutrition aspect so it's, it's kind of like a one-stop shop um, I've got probably about five kids that I'm dealing with in high school right now that have an opportunity to play high division of ball and go on to be very successful in life so that that's what excites me you know just building young men and women Great question, the Jordan 5. <laughs> Very comfortable shoe. I uh, love playing it. I believe I dropped 40 in it when I wore it for the first time in the game. Uh, I was wearing the, uh, I believe the all white ones. Yeah, when I was at Modern Day. So I wore a different pair of sneakers every game. Nike laced me, you know, with, with, with the clothes, the shoes. I mean, I was a walking billboard for them. So everything was in place, but the financial means itself. and. You know, I, I think I helped them sell a lot of shoes in, in, in the early 90s, so. <laughs>